Andy, what is the big takeaway you want everyone to hear today? The big takeaway is that your safety really is your responsibility. It is up to you. You don't need to be intimidated by that. You absolutely can do this. I don't care what your physical or mental shape is. You have the ability to take care of yourself and your loved ones. Don't shrink away from that responsibility. You can absolutely do this. Here's the million dollar question. How do men like us reach our full potential and grow into the men we dream of being while taking care of our responsibilities, working, being good husbands, fathers, and still take care of ourselves? That's the question. This podcast will help you with those answers. My name is Brent and welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast. Welcome to the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for all things man, husband, and father. Big shout out to Fallible Nation. You guys make shows like this possible and a warm welcome to our first time listeners. My name is Brent, and today my guest is author and host of the Secure Dad podcast, Andy Murphy. Andy, welcome to the Fallible Man podcast. Hey, Brent, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm excited to talk to you and your folks. I, it's going to be a great show, man. I've been looking forward to it. I enjoyed reading your book. You have some amazing points in it. But before we get serious, we have to get a little silly. So I okay. open the show with one silly question, and it's the average person in the U.S. opens what? 13 times per day? Is it A, the front door, B, a can of soda, C, the refrigerator, or D, a window? I guess I'm going to go with the refrigerator. That would be my guess. Okay. The official answer is refrigerator. Now, guys, don't cheat. Don't pause this and go look it up. Make your guess. Wait for the end of the show, and we'll find out if he's right about that. Andy, I don't do big introductions. In your own words, who is Andy Murphy? Sure. So Andy Murphy is a guy who has always been security minded. I did a podcast not long ago with a lady and I was telling her about, you know, what some of the stuff I used to do when I was growing up, because I was always the person that wanted to make sure everybody got home safe and all that sort of things. And she was like, oh, so you were a dad of the group and when you were a teenager. And I'm like, oh, no, I think I was. It's kind of a, a horrible thing to realize now, but it's kind of funny. But in my life, I was always somebody who was security minded. And I wanted to make sure that I brought up my family where safety was something that was very important to our family. And so what I try to do with the secure dad is I try to educate parents on what they can do, the small things that they can do in their lives every day to be just a little bit safer. I'm not one of these people who is, thinks, oh, you know, you have to have a moat and a fence with, you know, razor wire on it around your house to be safe all times. That's not what it is. There's just some simple things that you can do every single day that's going to make you and your family a whole lot safer at home and public and online. So I'm somebody who, always being security minded, realize there's other parents out there just like me who are wanting to be able to like haul in all of these thoughts that they have and focus them into what is necessary to protect their family. And that's really how the secure dad was born. Okay. And for those of you guys listening, you'll have to look at the artwork. Andy's logo is really cool for the secure dad podcast, <laughs> by the way, big kudos on that brother. That's, oh yeah. Thank you. That's very sharp. I'm liking that. It looked good on a hat too. It's hard to make those designs look good both on print it and is. embroidery. Mm -hmm. I had to change my logo a couple times because of like, it's like we can't embroider that. Right, um, right. Bummer. Now, Andy, if you could have a conversation with anyone in history, past, present, or future, who would it be and why? Oh, man. Oh, let's see. Past, present, or future. You know, being a Christian, I think I'm always supposed to say Jesus. I think that's always the answer, because if I don't say that, I'm afraid I might get in trouble when I get to heaven, that sort of thing. But obviously, talking to Jesus would be fun. But, you know, probably more, I think, realistically, I think it would be cool to talk to George Washington, knowing all of the stress that guy was under and just being who he was, being considered a, rebe a rebel against, you know, the British crown and being able to take a ragtag group of civilians and turn them into a fighting force to fight off the greatest army in the world. I mean, that guy had to have some pretty good insights about how to live life. And I think that's just, I know a lot, there's a lot of things that are just kind of trumped up about him that, you know, the whole, I, I cannot tell lie thing is not true, but just to be able to sit down and talk to the real man who made all of those decisions and had to look those soldiers in the eye and say, hey man, we're gonna cross this river in the dead of night and it's frozen and on Christmas day, we're gonna pop up and try to win our first battle here. That's some leadership, that's some guts. And I would like to be able to sit down and talk to him. That would be a cool conversation. I've never actually had that answer. Jesus oh, okay. is one answer. Uh, 
Yeah. I don't think there's a wrong answer, but I've actually started telling people like, okay, pick someone other than Jesus. Other than Jesus, who is, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> what purchase of $100 or less did you make in the last year that's had the biggest impact on your life? Let's see. Probably it's going to be, I got a new, it's, just, it's funny, a knife guy. So I got a new pocket knife not long ago. And it's one of the higher end ones because I was always one of those guys like, oh, I'll break it or whatever. And I don't ever want to like lose it or whatever. So I had to be responsible. So I got a name brand knife that I carry with me. And it's it's nice to have. And it's other people see it and it's like, oh, hey, that's cool. It's not terribly, you know, expensive or anything. But for me, it's a high end thing. And it's useful. They're useful every day for all sorts of things. A lot of people would think, you know, you carry a knife that you're a dangerous person and, or other people make fun of you. You're going to fight a bear today at lunch. And you're like, well, maybe, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, that's been something that's really useful. Being able to have a tool to get in and out of things is, has been a pretty good investment. Hey, I'm a pocket knife guy. I got my first pocket knife from my grandfather at six years old. I still have it, actually. I managed to hold on to it all these very years. Very good. Very good. But I, awesome. I'm never caught without a pocket knife. It's mm -hmm. the most useful tool. I think I, I've actually, like, they have a yearly study that comes out of, like, the most top 10 most useful tools. And knife mm -hmm. is always the top one or two. Yeah. I, yeah. I use my pocket knife for everything from cutting steak when I'm on the go and to prying things off. You'll find most of mine have the tip broken off where I've. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that. Got a little carried away in thinking what they could handle as far as prying things, but <laughs> yeah, and I'm just water just water 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 water. If I have a pocket, I get one that at least has half of a serrated blade on it because there's a lot of times you just really need to like saw into something to cut it off and not necessarily poke it or stab yourself, which I may or may not have done before. <laughs> so lesson learned there: half blade. My suggestion: half blade at least serrated. Okay. What's just one randomly strange fact about you? This one is weird. I didn't think this is the first thing that popped into my head. So I have actually gotten to meet Patrick Swayze when I was a kid. And so he was, uh, my dad was an extra in a TV series that he was in. So I sometimes freak people out when I tell people that Patrick Swayze once held me in his arms because I was four. And he was posing for a picture. So that's just kind of a, a random funny thing. And there's this picture uh, of me, my mom, dad, and Patrick Swayze from this shoot. So it's really cool. And he was always a really nice guy on set to my dad and a couple other people. So I've always had a big respect for him. And I was sad when he passed away a few years ago. That's very cool. What is one thing that everyone should know about you before we dig into this podcast? I don't take myself too seriously. I like to make self-deprecating jokes. I will fully admit I do not know everything. And so when I do say something, it's because I've researched it or I've experienced it or both. So it's when I say something, it's there's some weight behind it. And I'm not going to sit here and think that I'm an expert in everything because I am not. Okay, fair enough. Guys, we've been getting to know Andy just a little bit. I want you to know who this is that we're talking to and why this conversation is important. Coming up, we're going to dive into keeping your family safe, but what's really going on out there, why this should be a priority to you. We're going to roll to one of our sponsors and we'll be right back with more from Andy Murphy. One thing I usually don't share is how impactful the podcast has been for me personally. There's a lot I love and appreciate because I have the podcast. I become somebody who can approach people easier. I have a better network of people to call upon when I need them. I get to meet new people all the time from all walks of life and all over the globe and connect with them at a deeper level. And I have a voice to do what I love. I'm always put into situations where I'm having to stretch and learn something new. I've really grown as a person and a professional since I started doing my podcast. And that was even before my show really started growing. I hired a company called Grow Your Show, who's our sponsor, by the way. And I wanted to share them with you. The owner, Adam, has one of the very best podcasts for teaching you how to be a podcaster. I honestly wish I had found it sooner. One thing that they've done to help me is to bring me to a much larger listener base so that my voice is being heard around the world. There's a good chance, in fact, that they helped us connect. But they also do editing and post-production. They can even help you launch and start your podcast, which could really help you in your business or whatever you're trying to achieve. So I just wanted to give them a quick shout out. I love to share great people and companies that I believe in that I use personally. So that's Grow Your Show at growyourshow.com. I have a link in the show notes. And if you have a podcast or you want to start a podcast or you're thinking about it, just scroll down there, click that link and go work with my friend, Adam. He's going to treat you right. Guys, welcome back. 
we started with some getting to know Andy Murphy a little bit. And Andy Murphy is the host of the Secure Dad podcast. In the first part of the show, we just wanted to talk to him a little bit and see who he is, what he's about. In this section of the show, we're going to get into what's really going on out there, what you need to know about keeping your family safe and secure in the world we're living in these days. Now, Andy, you've written a book, Home Security, The Secure Dad's Guide to Easy Home Defense Techniques to Keep Your Family Safe. I can't believe I actually yep. named it all. Got my copy here. <laughs> book. It's a big title. <laughs> Thank you. You actually have another book as well on secure passwords, which mm -hmm. I know more than a few people who could use that. I have a background as an IT guy, so uh -huh. I know more than a few people who need that one. You actually have a podcast, the Secure Dad's podcast. What sets you on this path? You said earlier that you were always kind of security minded. What took you down this road? Sure. And I'll tell you the story. And I don't want to, I don't necessarily think that we need to follow this particular path only if you want to. So I was in high school at the same time the attack happened on Columbine High School. Now I was thousands of miles away. I was not there. And I remember we're going to school the next day and thinking, man, one of my classmates could be the next school shooter. You know, I had never ever once thought about the attacker being my fellow classmate. And I realized that while my school did have a school resource officer, that SRO was not going to be able to get to my classroom in time if something went wrong. So I realized in that moment, that my safety was my own responsibility. And that's huge. Most people don't have that understanding until they've been the victim of a crime or until they have thought, I'm in my last moments of life. So to have that thought without being physically threatened is kind of a lightning strike event. And so that's just one of those things that always stuck with me. I started to develop my own version of what is today called situational awareness. That was not something that existed or that term didn't exist back then. And so I tried to think about, okay, if something ha bad happens over here, how do I get away? If, you know, if I were going to do something bad, how would I do it? So I reverse engineer that to look at, okay, so what do I need to do to keep myself safe? And so that's really kind of where all of this started. I started really focusing on what is happening in my environment that could affect me? What did those pre-event indicators look like? Now, I've since then, you know, kind of been able to study with the best people in the world on this topic. And so I've been able to refine it a whole lot better. But that's kind of where things started was sitting in my classroom the day after Columbine and thinking, wow, that could happen here. My safety is my own responsibility. What am I going to do about it? That is a mic drop moment when people start to actually realize it's like, oh, wait. Yeah. The good guys aren't coming to save me necessarily. I see that meme on social media all the time. It actually kind of drives me nuts at this point. But it's because it, to me, it's like that's always been part. I had that early understanding fairly early on in the same kind of mm -hmm. things. I think we're fairly in the same age range. I remember that very mm -hmm. first. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's always been like, okay, this is going to be me, right? So now mm -hmm. I see that all the time on Instagram. No one's coming to save you. Right. A reminder, but apparently yeah. a lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, Brent, they live in bubbles and they think that, you know, everybody is like them, that they're good people who go to work nine to five every day and that, you know, murder doesn't happen all the time. People aren't trying to scam people. People aren't trying to, you know, abduct your children, that sort of thing. And that is happening. And that's a lot of cases, it's like it's out of sight, out of mind for people. But once it gets on your radar, it should never disappear. And you just need to understand that, hey, this is the reality of life. You know, you know, uh, homicide, homicide is, is, is a factor of life. So, life. so is, you know, being scammed for, scam for, you know, all of your money, money in the money bank and things like that. There are, unfortunately, bad people out there who want to take advantage of the good people. Always. Now, tell us a little bit about the Secure Dads podcast. Sure. So the Secure Dad podcast is a lot like yours. I follow a format where I will have a guest on and then I will do a solo show, but they usually focus on topics that are relevant to parents. And I call my audience protect your parents and protect your parents are those people who realize that keeping my family safe is something that I absolutely need to make a priority in my life. Now, every parent wants to be a protector, but not necessarily all of them own up to that responsibility. That's some part of parenting that some people just don't want to activate that part of their brain. 
my particular audience is always looking for ways to make themselves safer. And so I will, on a weekly basis, either talk to experts or do research from what I have experienced, from what I've seen, from what I've learned, and talk about different safety ideas that come from the perspective of trying to keep somebody safe at home, in public, and online. And the really over the past two years, the online safety and security has really exploded. And I just did a podcast that is on preventing child abductions. Now, you know, since you and I just talked about how we're kind of close in age, when, you know, we were little, we were talk, hey, taught, never talk to strangers, that sort of thing, because we were told that if we went to Kmart, you know, every other adult there wants to steal you. And that's just, you know, not the case. Today in 2023, most child abductions start online when a predator or a groomer reaches out online, establishes a relationship, works with your kid to build this fake friendship, and then there's eventually going to be an invite for a meetup in person, and that's when that individual is going to entice your kid to leave with them. It's not really going to be a snatch and grab off the street. Don't get me wrong, those do happen, but they're rare. So really, in a lot of ways to keep your kids physically safe, it has to start online because that's where our kids in 2023 are living a lot of their lives right now. Absolutely. Now, most men think they understand the concept of being a protector pretty well, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of our role as men, or yep. at least we like to think we do. What are some of the things that you see are often overlooked? Sure. So... I think a lot of people, it's not necessarily overlooked. I think a lot of people overestimate what they can do. I think if you've like never really been trained to fight, you know, especially as an adult, you may not be as good as you were when you had three fights and the last one was in the seventh grade. It's going to be a little bit different now that you are an adult. So I always, you know, stress to people to train on all sorts of things, train on how to fight, how to protect yourself, train in self-defense, train on, you know, how to render aid, first aid, you know, stop the bleed, that sort of thing. Those sorts of things are going to make you better. A lot of people will think, oh, well, if this happens, I will definitely be able to just magically get the skills necessary to survive this situation and look like a hero. Unfortunately, that's just not reality. When you were under the absolute stress of a life-threatening attack on yourself or your kid, you're going to just fall back to your lowest level of training. And if you don't have any, then you're going to have nothing. So that's why I really, you know, people overlook that. And that's one of the things that I really want to stress to people is, you know, even me, I encourage people, I encourage my listeners to go out at least once a year and get training on something. As a matter of fact, I've got a training opportunity coming up later this month that I'm really excited about. And so, that's why I encourage people to go get out of that comfort zone. Don't think that you're automatically going to have the answers. You're not going to all of a sudden gain the skills of Chuck Norris and you're going to be able to fight off 16 people. That's just not going to happen. So go out there and train for the reality of what's happening. I love that because I that's I hate to say that, but that's so man. Like we, we yeah, all think it right? is. Yeah, it is. And I thought we, that we, way we, too. I really did too. So yeah. We all got through school and you know, we like action movies and was like, oh yeah, I'd be fine in a fight. It's like, mm. you actually got punched, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Was it Tyson who said everybody thinks they're pretty tough until they get punched in the face? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Yeah. That's the right? quote. It's, yeah. It's uh, a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. We all think we're pretty tough. And it's like, last time you were in a fight, like, you hadn't even get like your full hype yet. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> Yeah. And especially, you know, if you're older and you've got, you know, an old football injury or whatever, and you go to take a swing and you pull something in your back, oh, man, yeah. you know, if you're not aware, you're going to put yourself into a situation where you're not going to be able to respond like you think. So that's why training and knowing your limits is a really good idea. I always found myself very physically capable growing up, but, mm -hmm. you know, looking now, it's like, man, I've yeah, torn up my shoulder. I've broken my back twice. Ooh. I don't know if I can move like that anymore or at that speed. Yeah. The reality is eventually we stop being 18, 19 year old spry in the prime of our physicality. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Time marches on. <laughs> I'm definitely stronger than I was at 18, but I'm certainly not mm -hmm. faster or more limber or anything like that. Right. Now, Andy, you touched on it a little bit and it's, it's a topic I definitely want to touch on a little deeper here is online security, right? This mm -hmm. is such a prevalent issue in our world today, 
I homeschool my kids, my wife, well, I should say my wife homeschools our kids and does an amazing job, <laughs> but awesome. you know, you are, people are online so much these days. Mm-hmm. And as a former IT guy, I know the vulnerabilities involved in that. Very, sure, very, yeah, for sure. So what are some things, particularly around social media and stuff that we need to look at as parents in keeping our family safe? Sure. So, you know, you have in your IT background talking about, you know, the exploits, you know, how all of that works. A few years ago, I realized I was not where I needed to be to understand what online threats were. So I really put in a focus to understand what was going to happen to my family. When I looked at this issue, I found that there's a lot of analog solutions to digital problems. And so one of the things that I kind of developed from this is to tell your children that they need to behave online as they would in person. A lot of people think that since they're behind that keyboard, they can say and do all sorts of things, never say and do to somebody's face. So you need to tell your kids that, hey, we have this expectation when you go to school that you're going to behave like this, or we go to the store, we go to church, wherever you're going, we have an expectation that this is the way you're supposed to behave. And we need to set that same expectation for online. We need to tell kids, hey, you don't need to make threatening comments to classmates. You don't need to post pictures of your classmates, you know, in memes. You don't need to take pictures and, you know, clothing that's, you know, you wouldn't go out in public in, those sorts of things. And that's going to help you avoid a lot of trouble right there. And also, and a big one that's happened is when, especially when online gaming, when online gaming happens, you make a contact. And that contact in the gaming world is called a friend, but they're not really your friend. To little kids, they don't understand that. So if they're playing Minecraft or something like that, you're like, oh, I added this friend. This person is my friend. Humans have an understanding of what friendship is, but when you put it into a digital perspective, it's completely different. So you have to tell your kids, okay, just because this person is called a friend on this gaming platform does not mean that they have full access to you as a person all the time. So you don't tell them where you go to school. Don't tell them, you know, your age. Don't tell them your birthday. Don't send them pictures. Don't let them send you things, that sort of thing. So if you can set the expectation for how your kids are supposed to behave and then tell them what what sort of information they are not supposed to share, they're going to be far ahead of everybody else and they're going to be a harder target for a predator. Okay. I actually have a personal pet peeve. I blame Facebook for the destruction of the concept of friend, right? Yeah, yeah, and see, yeah. When they named, they were the first ones to say, this person you make contact with is a friends list. Uh-huh. I was like, now I got like a, a couple friends. That That's uh-huh. it. I got a lot of acquaintances. I got a lot of people like I'll go around the way and be like, hey, what's up? Let's go out. Let's get a coffee or something. But the actual concept of friend really started to fall apart, I think, with Facebook labeling all your contacts as your friends. Mm-hmm. That, because, you're right. Yeah, man, you are right. Do you remember back when, oh, what was it? Was it MySpace? Was Cutthroat where you had to put your top eight friends on your profile page or something like that? I mean, that caused problems. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, you're right. The Facebook, we another thing to blame Facebook for. <laughs> you know, not there's not a real shortage of those. But, you know. <laughs> no. That's to me just tracing it back. That's always where it's like, man, this mm-hmm. really kind of started to get diluted right here. Mm-hmm. Now, Andy, there are a lot of people who think we're a little overprotective. You mm-hmm. know what? I, I can be a little overprotective. I'm sure I'll, I'll accept that. But let's talk about the difference between awareness, preparedness, and paranoia. Sure, it's a fine line, and it is. It's is as much as an individual as you are. There will be times that when you start to learn about situational awareness, it's kind of like the old adage, when you get a nice hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you just wanna you know, hammer in that new nail that you see. And there'll be a time when you start to look at situational awareness, understand what it is, and you will get paranoid. That's just part of, I think, the human learning process. And you've got to understand that, yes, you do have this skill set to look for pre-attack indicators, but chances are 99% of the places you walk into, you're not going to see that because nothing's actually happening. And sometimes you just kind of want to make it up. And that's where the paranoia and the anxiety can come in. And it's important to note those things so that when you start to feel that way, you start to have like this physiological response to something that's going on. 
especially in those early days, you got to say, okay, is this really happening? Or do I just kind of want this to happen so I can use my new skill? So it's, it's just something that you've got to learn as you go. And you just got to put in the experience to understand what's really going on. Because there'll be sometimes you look at something and you'll say, hey, that wasn't really anything. But then you'll see that exact same behavior on like a ring video that's been uploaded to Instagram. And it was actually the a pre-event indicator to a crime in that particular scenario. So it's really all based on who you are and where you are. But don't let that scare you in starting your journey to be prepared. Don't let that scare you in your journey to understand human behavior because that's all part of the learning process. And once you get a handle on it, it's actually, it's really good. So one of the things that I like to do, a lot of people get burned out when they start to try to understand what's going on around them because your brain can only handle so much of this type of processing. Cause after a while, it's just going to get burned out. So you can't do it all the time. So I tell people to develop what's called secure habits. And those secure habits, and we'll make up, you said, you know, invite a friend out for coffee. That was something you said a second ago. So like, if I were to meet a friend for coffee, I would sit to where I could kind of see what was going on. And you want to be present in those moments. You don't want to be completely paranoid looking at all of the exits. This guy's reaching into a bag over here. What's he going to pull out? What's going to happen? You know, that sort of stuff. You're not Jason Bourne, that sort of thing. So it's really Every once in a while, when there's a break in the conversation, take a quick look around, see who is, you know, acting like they're supposed to be in that environment, who maybe looks agitated, who maybe looks too calm, that sort of thing. And those are the things you're supposed to pay attention to. But then come back to the person that you're there present with, whether it's your friend that you're getting coffee with or your wife on a date, that sort of thing, and pay attention to her because that's why you're here. That's what you're doing. But then also use the secure habits every once in a while. Just take stock of what's happening around you. And then if you do see something, you may have to divert a little bit more attention to that to make a decision as to what you need to do next. But if you just work it in those little areas, you know, the person you're with, a little further out to what's going on at the restaurant, and then I'm going to take a look around at what's going on on the door. If you can just rotate between those three things, that's a great start. Okay. I had a colleague who I knew him enough years that I got to see him go from, you know, younger guy who like was shy away from family conversations to engaged, to married, to children, right? I worked with him long enough over the years and he had a son and was loving life. He came to me when his son was like a year and a half old and he just had this like almost distressed look about him. And I asked him like, hey man, what's going on? He's like, well, my wife's pregnant. I was like, dude, congratulations. That's amazing news. Why do you look? He's like, how do you sleep at night? Because I have two daughters. And he had just found out his wife was suspecting a little girl. And he was just like, it, he said, everything changed. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I don't know. I didn't feel about this with my son. But the minute she said she was pregnant with the girl, like, I said, yes, everybody in the world became a creep and an enemy. Yes. Yes. I like it. <laughs> You're right. I, You're right. I told him, it's like, the trick is to not fall into that paranoia because that's, that's the hardest thing when you get that news is you instinctively want to protect your child. Mm -hmm. You instinctively, especially, right, men are drawn to protect women more than we are boys. We're taught boys are supposed to be rough and tumble, but, mm -hmm. you know, becoming a father makes you a little more paranoid. Having girls makes you really paranoid because every guy is now a creep. You never look at a girl <laughs> the quite the same way again. Right, right, right. All those little teenage girls on Instagram, I'm just like, put some clothes on, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's gone. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. Go to the gym. You're like, get dressed. Mm -hmm. Just get dressed. What's wrong with you? <laughs> but the trick is to not go too far down that rabbit hole, right? right. Life has got to continue. And you should always be aware of what's going around you. I've had mm -hmm. the privilege of being around a lot of military guys and intelligence community guys and officers of the law and just watching them over the years in all these public situations. And I had a friend who he could never sit with his back to the door. He worked in military intelligence when he was in the military. And like he wouldn't strike most people as paranoid, but it was fun to watch and observe him, right? The way he watched the room very casually, very comfortably, right? He didn't look paranoid. He didn't look worried. But I knew without a doubt he was aware of everything that was happening. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what we're talking about with situational awareness, right? It's not right. necessarily letting it rapidly change who you are as much as just being more aware, paying attention to what's going on around you, right. not being oblivious. People walking around with their phones down in their hand or their head down in yep. their phone. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's driving me nuts. I see yeah, it drives me crazy. Yeah, I, I took my wife Christmas shopping at the mall. I think last Christmas, two Christmases ago, and I just don't go to malls. I'm not a mall guy, you know, that sort of thing. So I took her and she wanted to go to this, you know, sale or whatever. And so I'm like, oh, I'm just going to sit and people watch, you know, because that's what I do. I do like to do that, see, you know, practice skills, all this sort of stuff. So I realized when I'm sitting there on this bench that I'm the only person who doesn't have their phone out. Everybody else has their phone out. And that makes me the anomaly in this situation. That makes me look like the weird guy. Oh, everybody else here has their phone, but that dude over there doesn't, you know, and he looks like nice and he's smiling at people. What's wrong with him? You know, and so I was like, well, I guess I got to get my phone out so I don't appear to be that abnormal. So I would just hold my phone up. It's like still on my lock screen. So I just look down at it every once in a while and then look back up around at everybody else who had their face in their phone. And I'm thinking, man, like I could have walked up to like a number of people and just picked their purse up and just walked off. And I don't think they ever would have noticed. Try not to laugh here, guys, and laugh over him talking because it's killing me because I I know I knew exactly how that story was going to play because I've done Mm -hmm. that. I've been sitting in like a waiting room Mm -hmm. and I love to watch people. And I've been sitting in a waiting room. I notice everybody's like in the like. So I'll pull out my phone and hold it in my hand. And yeah. Look up and watch a little bit and look down at my phone. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> because yep. you realize that's how it that goes. I stand out right now. And honestly, that's part of situational awareness too, is you don't want to stand out all the time. Right. Right. You know, they, most of the guys I've known over the years who worked in like special forces, amazing men, but they were, never wait they don't look like arnold schwarzenegger right right? it it doesn't look Mm -hmm. like movies they are experts at looking like everybody else not standing out not being noticeable that's the last thing they generally want hey guys we're having some fun conversation about this talking about the situation when we come back from a break we're going to get into how you can start to implement better actions better choices and build yourself a plan for how you can keep your family safer. Because ultimately, we all want to keep our family safe. We all want to take care of the people we love. And Andy's going to help us do that in this next section of the show. How well do you sleep at night? Do you toss and turn and wake up more tired than when you went to bed? Sleep is commonly one of the critical elements people fall short on in their life. The quality of sleep you get directly affects your ability to control your weight, your ability to add muscle, your stress levels, and your everyday job and life performance. If you're ready to move to the next level, then sleep, has to be part of the plan. Check out our friends at ghostbed.com if you're ready to get your best sleep. I love my ghost bed. I've been sleeping on one for a couple of years and has made a huge difference in how I sleep. Hit ghostbed.com and use the code thefallibleman30 to get 30% off your order and start getting better night's sleep tomorrow. Now, let's go on to the show. Welcome back, guys. We're here with the host of the Secure Dad podcast, Annie Murphy, talking about keeping our loved ones safe. We're going to help you build a plan to make it easier on you, to make you more prepared and to help you protect that what's most important to you. Now, Andy, you have something that you called a layered home defense strategy. Yes. And I, I wanted to introduce that concept to our listeners so they can understand what's going on there and how this is more beneficial, right? Because a lot of us want to fall back to, oh, well, you know, I'll just fight my way out of it. And that's probably not the best answer. Sure. So yeah, when when it comes to home security, and this is where this comes in, it's you want to have a plan because when the alarm goes off or the dog starts barking or you hear somebody kicking in the front door, that is not the time to make a plan. That's the time to execute your plan, which means you've had to think about this well in advance. So what you need to understand first is you got to take responsibility that, you know, your safety is your own responsibility. That's the thing that you have to understand. And if you're a dad, uh, then your responsibility is also your wife. It is also your children. So that's a big thing that you've got to get straight first mentally. So really like the precursor to the layer home defense strategy is going to be your mental awareness. It's going to be what you are prepared to do, 
what you know that you've done and you've made a plan in advance. So when you take a look at this, the first step in this process, I actually call discipline. And what is in discipline? You know, there's like the five D's of home security and nobody can ever remember what they are. So I came up with my own. So the first one is discipline. And it's really going to be the day-to-day -day stuff of locking your doors, locking your windows, making sure that, you know, if a, a cleaning service has been in your house or technicians have been in your house, making sure that the windows are closed and locked after they left in my particular area. There was a case where there was a home cleaning service that was kind of a fly-by-night operation and they were going around and cleaning up people's houses, but they would leave one window unlocked because then the rest of their crew would come in later when they knew that the homeowner wasn't there. They would open up that window, steal whatever they wanted to, slip back out that window, and they were gone. The problem with this particular crew is they they did it like three times in one week. So the police found them like pretty quick. That was a, a pretty easy one to figure out. But if you have the discipline to go around every night, make sure that your doors and windows are locked, make sure that the you know alarm system is set on, that's going to be the thing that helps you. Byron Rogers is an executive protection guru. And he was on my show one time and he was like, man, you can have all the greatest defenses in the world, but if you don't, you know, arm your alarm system, if you don't make sure that your weapons are ready to go, if you don't make sure your doors are locked, it doesn't matter because if you can't handle the discipline of what this is, then you are, you know, you're not going to win because you have chosen not to take this seriously. So discipline is the first part. So the next part is deterrence. And this is something when it comes to home security that I don't think people understand. And that is, you don't want somebody to break into your house. I think there's all sorts of memes online about, there's like a stand-up comedian who's like, oh, I have this fantasy about somebody breaking into my house where I do all of these things and all that. It's not going to happen. Kind of like we alluded to earlier, you're not going to gain the skills of Chuck Norris. The best thing for you to do with your family is to win the fight before it ever starts. And that means you make your home a hard target so that it is never chosen for a break-in in the first place. You just subtly communicate to somebody who wants to break into your home that, hey, this is going to be a lot harder to do. The juice is not worth the squeeze here go check out the neighbor's house. And that can be done by at night. A lot of people, they turn off all the lights inside and outside and it is completely dark. Well, darkness is a thief's best friend. So what you wanna do is take that darkness away because in that darkness, they can move up close to your house. They can look in the windows. They can check and see if the front door's unlocked, all those sorts of things. So if you just simply add light to your property, that's gonna make it a harder target simply because they know, hey, wait a minute, if I get close enough here, I'm going to get spotted. One of the easiest ways to do that, and I don't necessarily recommend products because a lot of what I talk about is preparedness and mindset, but one of the easiest products that you can get right now that's going to help make your home safer is something called a dawn to dusk light bulb. And what that is, it's a light bulb with a little photo sensor in it, and it will know when the sun is up and when the sun is down. And when the sun is up, it stays off. When the sun goes down, it comes on. So you just put that in your porch light, just screw it on in, flip the switch and walk away. And when the you know sunset happens, it's gonna come on and it's gonna protect your front door, which is by the way, the number one way that those get in your home is through the front door. You think it'd be something a little bit sneakier, but according to all of the stats over the last few years, people like to come in through the front door. So you put that on the dust light bulb up there, you flip the switch, walk away, think about it again, but it's gonna add that light to your front door and someone's gonna look at it and say, you know what? I don't have a clear path here. And if I try to kick this door in, you know, people are going to see me from three to four houses down. I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to go to the house that looks darker. So that's just a subtle way that you can communicate. And that's going to be a subtle way that, you know, really deter anything from happening. And you may not ever realize how your deterrence work because nothing ever happens. It's kind of like, well, I've done all this stuff to my house and nobody's tried to break in great. Like, that's the point. You don't want that to happen. You don't want somebody to break into your home and you have to physically defend yourself. So let's do everything that we can to make sure that doesn't happen. And so the next one is fortify. And this is when you want to make it, if somebody does get 
and bolded enough to come and try to break in your door, that it's going to take the longest time that it can for that to happen. It's going to make a lot of noise. You're going to be aware that something is going on and the alarm is going to go off. So one of the things that you can do there, you know, you're a dad, I'm a dad. So when you look at, excuse me, so when you look at fortifying your home, you can't fortify it to the point that you can't get out in the event of a fire. A lot of people are like, oh, let's, you know, bar the door. Let's do all these things and put 97 locks on it. I understand where you're coming from there, but you need to make smart choices because you need to get be able to get out in the event of a fire, something like that. Or you may need a first responder to come break down your door because your house is on fire or because you've had some sort of medical emergency and EMS has got to get into you, that sort of thing. So depending on the age of your kids, depending on where you live, those sorts of things, make smart decisions about how you need to fortify your door, all that sort of stuff. And that can be covered there in the book and a few other the resources that I have. So th that's just kind of where you start. There's a whole plan to it. It's not, again, when somebody starts kicking in the door, that's not when you think of what to do. That's when you act. Okay. And guys, the book is an easy read. Like he, yeah. he didn't make it long and drawn out. He didn't throw in a bunch of information that was useless. I sat down and read it in, in one session. And yes. all of it is very valid. It's very easy to understand. It's just a step-by-step -step structure that is completely understandable and translatable. That's so, that's important. I read a lot of books. And so the fact that it is just, this is what I need to know. You, you didn't try and get fancy. You didn't add a bunch of fluff. This is what I need to know. This is what I Brett, need to consider. It does me a lot of good hearing you say that because that is exactly what I wanted. Because you are a busy dad. And I wanted you to be able to sit down and read that book quickly, get everything that you needed to do to empower you to make good, safe decisions for your family. So that is awesome. That is that is exactly what it's for. Guys, of course, that will be in the library on the website. We'll also have links in the show notes and in the description of everything so you can get that book. Now, there's a lot that's going to go on in these kind of circumstances, right? In a worst mm -hmm. case scenario, one yes. of the things you talked about is needing to exercise a family protection plan and, and plan it. Mm -hmm. It's not something I had ever considered before. Like it's, you know, we all think about fire drills. Well, what happens if the house catches on fire, right? Mm -hmm. We teach our children that. It's never once occurred to me. It's like, I do I teach my children what happens if they hear really loud sounds in the night? Mm-hmm. Yeah, depending on what your kids are mature enough to understand, then yeah, you need to let them know a little along as to what you want them to do. Also know that in a panic of something like this, your kids may not respond like they're supposed to. So you still, as the parent, are still probably going to have to go get them, put your hands on them, make sure that they're moving away from danger, that sort of thing. You can't, you can't count on young, inexperienced minds to make the best decision in such a dynamic, stressful situation. So yeah. Like talk to them about, okay, if at night, you know, somebody tries to get in through the front door, we meet here or mommy and daddy is going to come and get you. And we're going to go back to this safe room, or we are going to flee the house. We're going to call this person responsible for calling 911. If you have an older person in the home, maybe you actually barricade yourself. One person barricades themselves with that older person to protect them, that sort of thing. Those are all things that are unique to your family that you do need to talk about that you do need to have sure, you know, a full understanding of what's going on and actually walk through it. Don't make it scary, kind of make it a game, especially if you have younger kids, you know, oh, hey, there's a problem at the front door. What do we do? Okay, we're all gonna get up and we're gonna go to the back door and we're gonna go out through the backyard and we're gonna go to this neighbor for help, that sort of thing. And you don't want to, schools are getting into a lot of trouble right now because a lot of the, active shooter training has been too realistic for some kids. So there's that fine line and you being the parent of your children, you know what they can handle, you know what they're ready for, you know how to speak to them, which is one of the things that I like about the secure dad. I provide the parents information and then the parents become smarter and then they make the choices for their kids. I don't tell your kids what to do. You love them, you know them, you educate them in the way that they are ready for. I love what you said earlier about you fall back. Most of us have heard the concept of you fall back to your training. Mm -hmm. I liked how you phrased it better. You fall back 
to the lowest point of your training. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily fall back to your best guys. Right. Always strive to continue to grow, to learn, to improve, because you will go back to the base level <laughs> in the highest yep. stress situation. Now, Andy, what are the first three steps our listeners should take away right now? Say they, they listen to this podcast. What are the first three steps they can take to start sure. you more securely? Yeah, first, take responsibility for your own personal safety. Do not outsource that to anybody else. You don't outsource that to a good Samaritan. You don't outsource that to the police. I'm not talking bad about first responders. First responders, in the word they respond, they're not necessarily always proactive. They'll call, they'll come when 911 is called, but you got to survive to that point. Then you got to survive beyond that. So, so it's up to, it's up to you first. first. Take care of yourself. yourself. So, and any police officer so, 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 tell you so, that. You've got to do something first for somebody else to get to you. So number one, you need to take responsibility for your safety. If you are married, if you are uh, a father, you need to take responsibility for the people who live in your house. That's going to be your wife. That's going to be your kids. You have to take this and put it to the through the perspective of everybody who's in your family. What are they doing that's good? What are they doing that's kind of questionable? How can you empower them to make safer decisions for themselves? How can you be that good example for what to do? And then I think number three is really for kids right now is to set the expectations of how they need to behave online. More and more of their world is shifting online. And like I said earlier, a lot of physical face-to-face, -face, you know, abductions start online. You really need to sit down and have a conversation with them and say, this is how you're expected to behave online. This is what you can and can't say. You know, like you said, with Facebook, these people aren't really your friends. And if you can just really clamp that down, because that's where most of our kids want to be. They want to be playing games or they want to be texting on their phone and things like that. A lot of our kids' worlds right now is online. So if you can do those three steps, you're going to be moving in the absolute right direction, and you're going to be a whole lot better off than most of the people around you. What's next for Andy Murphy? What is next for Andy Murphy? I am working on a new book that's going to be all about safety conversations that we need to have with our kids. I will show you what those conversations are, the main points that you need to hit, how to even start those conversations. Because a lot of people are like, oh, I want to talk to my kid, you know, about like online grooming and kind of what that looks like, but I just don't know how to do it. I will show you how to do that in this new upcoming. That's awesome. That's going to be a really important book, guys, because that is a conversation you seriously need to be having. Where is the best place for people to find you? Sure. You can find everything about me at thesecuredad.com. You can also check me out on Instagram with the username thesecuredad. It's also the same on Twitter. By the way, I do have a free reference for you. If you go to the link in the show notes, you'll be able to see this. This is like a quick start guide to home security that I want everybody to have. And it's yours for free because I want you to have it. I want you to not only feel safer when you go to bed at night, I want you to know that you are safer. Oh, bummer on me. I thought I had that already pre-planned when I was recording the show. I thought I had that link. Guys, it will okay. be on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. It will be in the show notes and in the description, whatever platform you're enjoying the show on. Now, going back to our silly question, the average person in the U.S. opens what 13 times per day? Is it a front door, a can of soda, a refrigerator, or a window? And you guessed refrigerator. I the did. The answer is refrigerator. You are right. Okay. <laughs> the average person opens their refrigerator 13 times a day. If you're a father, you know your children do it a lot more than that. <laughs> yes. Guys, Andy has laid a lot at our, it's our responsibility. We know we're supposed to be the protectors of our family, but there is so much to take in. Andy is offering you solid tools to help make your life easier as a father when it comes to taking care of your family. Andy, what is the big takeaway you want everyone to hear today? The big takeaway is that your safety really is your responsibility. It is up to you. You don't need to be intimidated by that. You absolutely can do this. I don't care what your physical or mental shape is. You have the ability to take care of yourself 
and your loved ones, don't shrink away from that responsibility. You can absolutely do this. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you, Annie, for being on the show. Be better tomorrow because of what you do today. We'll see you on the next one. This has been the Fallible Man Podcast, your home for everything man, husband, and father. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a show. Head over to www.thefallibleman.com for more content and get your own Fallible Man gear.